pictures on my first visit, and there was one, but uh, it just showed Eliezer from the back and too far. <laughs> so I thought, uh, you know, I would just put this one in because it's a nice picture. And actually, I think this picture was taken before we met. So um, I'm going to talk about something different from what I originally intended to talk about. And the subject is probably such that both Elias and Shimon think that this is something unusual for me to talk about. But uh, this is an unusual conference. And I should say that uh, I've always greatly enjoyed not just the friendship, but also discussing phys physics with both of you, and also the open-mindedness. And I, I still remember we have you know, widely ranging discussions. <coughs> And I hope I will also be able to enjoy those discussions in the future. And I think it's also important to have, uh, you know, keep an open mind for other things, which is another thing I appreciated about these conversations. And I also think it's important to have an open mind about physics, about physics possibilities, and sometimes to talk about, you know, think along different lines. So the subject of my talk is conformal symmetry in the standard model. And I should also say that uh, at the beginning of the year, Eliezer said to me that anything that has the title conformal in it would arouse his interest. And I thought, well, then I'm not going to talk about KE10, but rather something like this. This is work I've been doing with uh, Krzysztof Meissner from Warsaw University. There's a paper, but also work in progress. We're trying to somewhat consolidate uh, what we have. So, so, oops. So this is the table of contents, and you will see this is a fairly traditional talk, uh, in the sense that you will probably recognize or know about many of the things that I will talk about. Um, that's, you know, these conferences are also a nice place to give such talks. Uh, it's good once every now and then to have the opportunity to give a talk. <coughs> completely incomprehensible inco after, after the first uh, three minutes. So as I said, much of this will be known to you. And we put, except maybe that we put these uh, things together in a slightly different way than done before. So what is the, uh, well, already this morning we've uh, heard about uh, what the question is, what is going to, what we're going to see at LHC, what comes after the standard model. And as the starting point of my talk, I would like to take an observation which seems rather basic, but nevertheless, uh, at least to me, seems rather striking, namely the fact that the standard model of elementary particle physics, as is, is conformally exactly invariant at tree level, except for a single term. And this single term is the fa well, this famous uh, mass term minus m squared phi dagger phi, which induces spontaneous symmetry breaking and gives masses to the vector bosons via the proud angler higgs mechanism, as well as to the quarks and leptons. Now, everybody's aware that uh, this, this is the main reason that people are somewhat uneasy about the standard model because at this point it looks like it's somehow engineered. You just put it in uh, to, to make, to give, for it to give what you want it to give. But uh, we also know that the scalar fields, in particular such as mass terms, are reason to worry. Uh, well, first of all, there's the question, if it's there, why does it appear with, why does the m squared appear with a minus sign in front of it? And the other question is, uh, why is this, uh, this mass term so small in comparison to the Planck scale. Now, I think, well, this is also related to this uh, occurrence of quadratic divergences in scalar field theory. But, uh, you know, from the point of view of renormalizable quantum field theory, I've never thought it was such a good argument because uh, renormaliza renorm renormalization is renormalization. Renormalization theory doesn't worry, care too much whether your uh, divergences are quadratic or logarithmic. But when you think about the modern way, about the standard model, namely as a theory that is embedded in some other theory at some higher scale, 
then the question arises, why is this thing not of the order of this cutoff scale or maybe even the Planck scale? So this is the famous hierarchy problem, and the problem is to explain <coughs> it on the one hand. And if, if you cannot explain it and fine-tune it, then at least you have to, have, have to make sure that uh, you can somehow stabilize this fine-tuning. So the most popular proposal, but we've already heard about this morning, is making the standard model uh, supersymmetric, MSSM, or some extended version of that, and to use supersymmetry to control uh, quantum corrections via the cancellation of quadratic divergences. And in this way, this <coughs> quadratic thing becomes replaced by a logarithmic thing. Now, on the other hand, there's also some me mechanism which has been well known, has been around for a long time, which is also very beautiful, the so-called Coleman-Weinberg mechanism. Uh, as Coleman and Weinberg pointed out in 1973, you can, the idea is to induce spontaneous symmetry breaking not by including an explicit mass term, but by radiative corrections. So this is what they did, they calculated an effective potential uh, by summing one loop diagrams, arrived at this famous logarithmic uh, uh, correction here and putting this, all these fields to be independent of space and time. And then when you look at uh, uh, minimize this potential, you discover that indeed <coughs> the minimum has moved away from the origin <coughs> to some other place and therefore you have induced a spontaneous uh, expectation value of the scalar field. So this gives you somehow the idea that, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could start with a conformally invariant theory in four dimensions and try to explain the emergence of small mass scales as an effect of a conformal anomaly via this effective potential. Now already at this point there's a kind of paradox here because you think, how can that be? Perturbation theory. <laughs> perturbation theory is perturbation theory. It means that you have some result and then you wiggle a little bit but you don't change the result qualitatively. So is this, uh, is this real or is this just a mirage? Now in fact, this was already pointed out by Coleman Weinberg in their paper. In fact, sometimes it is a mirage. Um, so in particular, it turns out that for a, a pure fight of the force theory, this, this effect is spurious or fake. And one way to see it is that if you look at this equation at the minimum, you will find that, uh, that uh, the equations determining the minimum are such that you're somehow out outside the range of validity of perturbation theory. This is why the uh, Coleman Weinberg then <coughs> went to another model. They extended the model, making including electrodynamics, get scalar electrodynamics, and at that, <coughs> that theory you have two coupling constants, scalar self-coupling and uh, electromagnetic coupling constant. And then they noticed that if you take the scalar self-coupling to be of the order of e to the fourth, then you can actually consistently make it can have a consistent uh, spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking. This at the time was called dimensional tr uh, transmutation, meaning that you replace two coupling constants by one coupling constant and a vacuum expectation value. I, I think that maybe one should not think about this reducing to one coupling constant, but rather that in the space of <coughs> coupling constants, lambda and E, there's a certain sector or region where, the, where this effect is perturbatively uh, credible, and there's a large range where it's not perturbatively credible. So there's been a lot of literature about this here, some, some more recent papers. Now the next question is, if, if this is so, is there, can this be made to work for the real world? meaning the standard model. Now there are some facts that must be accommodated that were not known in 1973. Meaning the fact that the Higgs mass is so large that there's a very heavy top and furthermore there are um, right-handed neutrinos, massive neutrinos and uh, well they're there. And uh, so the original prediction of Coleman Weinberg was Higgs mass like a 10 GeV, but you see that this is vastly exceeded here. But there's another danger that if you tune up the scalar self-couplings, you run the Landau poles. And now, I think most people would interpret the fact that this is so small via the seesaw effect to be evidence for a very large scale 
on the order of 10 to the 10 GV. So now what I want to discuss in this lecture is a sort of minimalistic proposal. So this is somewhat opposite of MSSN. Simply take what's there, start with this classical conformal invariant, add all the things we know of that are there, meaning right chiral neutrinos, and try to make the model conformal invariant and try indeed try to get everything from this effective potential. Now what we will need in this is that uh, we'll try <coughs> to get uh, things from you know, tuning Yukawa coupling constants and we will have to allow <coughs> ourselves to tune them in such a way that they range between 1 and 10 to the minus 5. This is not an assumption whether you like it or not but this, this is actually the size over which Yukawa couplings vary in nature. I will say something about dimensional regularization in a minute. So that means that there are no large intermediate scales, no, no guts, and in fact also no new scales to require to explain small neutrino masses. This is in keeping with the philosophy because if we were to introduce such small scale, scales, then the thing could not be <coughs> classically conformally invariant. And there's no low energy supersymmetry. So this is the model. As I said, it's minimalistic. So it's the standard times the standard model, just enlarged by a few more terms to account for the right-handed neutrinos. And instead of a large M, <coughs> which is usually put here to get the seesaw mechanism, we put a scalar field. This makes this conformal invariant. And then we add uh, the other terms that are allowed by conformal invariance. So it means that in addition to the usual Higgs doublet, there's a, another scalar field. You take it to be real. We could also take it to be complex. Then you would get a Goldstone boson or pseudo Goldstone boson, or even in a non trivial representation of family symmetry. So, this model, as is all the terms that you can write down, it is renormalizable, and the classical tree level Lagrangian is conformal invariant. So, it means no mass terms, all coupling constants dimensionless. So the u bar couplings are written here, they're written y, and the only indices I write out are the family indices, which uh, is ij, one from one to three. And then there's some others, and <coughs> as a standard in the standard model, you can diagonalize them by rotating the fermions. So you can make uh, uh, the ones, the, the standard ones, uh, uh, real and diagonal. And uh, then you're left with two complex three by three matrices. This one, the YD is just the standard CKM matrix, but there's another matrix uh, involving this uh, coupling of the right-handed neutrinos to the left-handed uh, fermions. So these things are parameterized family mixings and give you more. But uh, this, this, as I said, this is there anyway. You, you will, in any, any model of uh, extent going beyond the standard model, you will have to include uh, these couplings. So. Now, coming back to the Coleman-Weinberg action, the, the computation of the effective action involves the computation of this integral, which is divergent. This integral uh, um, is obtained by summing an infinite number of uh, one-loop diagrams. And uh, the G here is some expression quadratic in the, the scalar fields in, in the phi to the fourth type context. But it may be more complicated if you have uh, several scalar fields. So if you look at the textbooks, how it's done in the textbooks, this in integral is regulated by introducing an ultraviolet cutoff lambda. And when you do the integral, this is the expression you get. You see the cutoff appearing here and here. And you see in order to get a finite limit, one has to introduce another mass scale, namely normalization scale, uh, mu. And then to renormalize and keep things fixed, physical parameters fixed while sending uh, lambda to infinity and putting the normalization parameter a certain value. Now, we think that uh, there's a, s a slightly better way of doing it. It's not, I mean, you can use any kind of regularization, but some regularizations are better than others, just like dimensional regularization is better in gauge theories. Um, because it seems that this violates the assumed conformal invariance in the least possible way. So let me remind you that conformal invariance must be broken explicitly if you want to compute quantum corrections. 
either via the introduction of an explicit cutoff and the normalization scale, or in dimensional regularization, you simply, the dimension is a parameter, and then this scale V. And then you simply replace in the standard way all uh, momentum space integrals by integrals in deep equals four plus two epsilon dimensions. And you see in order to get, keep the dimension right, you have to introduce this scale in front. And this is done for every, so there's only a single scale which you have to inject. And then uh, you do this for uh, all diagrams. So this gives the renormalized effective action to any loop order in such a way that there are no explicit mass terms either in the di direction of finite parts. This is because this uh, appears with, a, as one says, evanescent power. Uh, so that guarantees that, uh, well, there are no, first of all, there are no explicit mass terms. The counter term Lagrangians of the same type as the one we started with. It's also conformally invariant. The only, the anomaly arises with the interplay of the divergences and uh, when you expand this in epsilon. So that guarantees that the conformal symmetry is broken only by logarithmic terms of uh, these types, which appear in any, to any uh, power in any, if you go to higher loops. And then there's this nice uh, master formula to do it in dimensional regularization. So this integral is a function of a complex parameter C. The integral converges in this uh, strip. And then one has to analytically continue this expression to Z equals plus two. So this, this works for all, for all uh, contributions. <coughs> That's effectively what it amounts to. If you had, if you had m squared terms in the, I mean, quadratic divergence would be m squared phi squared divided by epsilon. Oh, but when you say there's a quadratic divergence in the standard model, yes. you could say when I yes, mention right. regularization, there is no standard. Right. Well, there would be, I mean, yes, there is in some sense, because that if you have start with a mass term from the beginning, there will be divergences, one over epsilon times m squared phi squared. That, The mass. Never, never yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm aware of this objection. Yes. I don't want to. No, I don't want to overplay this. But I just, I just wanted to say that this is a, you know, rather straightforward. I mean, there are endless discussions about quadratic divergences. So, but, but so let's apply this. So here's the result for the scalar sector, and I think this is a new. I haven't seen this anywhere in the books. So this is. Usually it's given for ON invariant uh, scalar models, but you can make it also with two scalar fields. And this is the formula you get. And because of the mixing of these scalar fields, you also get these uh, funny uh, square roots. So this formula can then be specialized to the model at hand. Then we have a complex doublet counting real fields. N is equal to 4. Real scalar, and because so this term is not there. But if you have a complex scalar field, then this uh, term would be there. So that's the scalar fields. The fermionic contributions are more or less standard. <coughs> At least this one this is the contribution from the quarks, which is dominated by the top quark. Uh, for the leptons, it's more complicated because now we have all these mixing matrices. And you have to do this uh, kind of integral, where this determinant is still to be taken over three by three matrix in, in flavor space. So in order to integrate, do this integral, you would have to factorize uh, effectively a sixth order equation, which cannot be done. But uh, one therefore does this kind of, makes this kind of approximation. Um, and then, then it simply collapses to, then this is the only term that uh, survives. So here's the final uh, result in this, uh, with these approximations. And also, this is the new Yukawa involving this uh, right hand neutrinos. So you see again the terms, three level terms, uh, the ones induced by the effective potential. Not included here, but that would be easy to include are terms from the uh, weak uh, couplings to weak gauge bosons. But those couplings are small, so let's neglect them in the first approximation. And also from SU3 from color, because this is a two loop effect. 
Now this potential, unfortunately, we're not able to minimize it or exotomize it analytically, also because of these uh, square roots in there, and therefore we have to do numerical analysis. Um, okay. So, this is a little bit of uh, trial and error, and I should say right away that these numbers are not yet the final numbers. We've just tried and see, and uh, see, try to see how far we get. Uh, there are strong constraints from both, uh, well, first of all, you don't want to be in conflict with any experimental data, which means you don't want, don't want to be the Higgs field to be the Higgs mass to low, of course, so that's one constraint. But there are also theoretical constraints, which I'm going to discuss on the next, or slide after the next slide. But anyway, assuming making, you know, this is a set of parameters that works, but one still has to explore with a better, better parameters than this. So this is the values we've, up, you see up to this point, one can compute, pretend that uh, things don't, you know, it's a completely dimensionless calculation. Only at this point you insert, you set one scale, which then uh, sets the scale for everything else. And then you get, first of all, you get uh, these scalar fields mix. I will come back to this in a moment. And this is, this is, uh, this is the kind of value you get. Let me emphasize once more that there's uh, this Higgs mixing, but only the components along H coupled to the usual standard model particles. So as I said, this, this, this way one can avoid introducing a large mass scale in order to get small uh, neutrino masses. You see, this, this is not simply, this is just the seesaw formula, but rather than an MD squared, MD Rx squared divided by 10 to the 10 or 11 GeV, we here make it work or try to make it work with, uh, with the Yukawa coupling constant. A difference with a standard scheme is that the heavy neutrinos become, turn out to be much lighter than you would get in a sort of more standard picture. So this is a set of values. Uh, as I said, there's experimental constraints, but there are also theoretical constraints, which I'm going to discuss. Now, um, I've entitled this uh, Schiele and Charybdis. This is taken from Ulysses, as perhaps you know. What? It, it, I will come back to that. The, y, the, the, the V, there's a factor of 10 to the minus 5, which we will have to uh, discuss again. I'll come back, I, I comment on that. This, so there's a one parameter V, and this, at this point it seems rather small. Okay, so you have to, so let me, uh, so we, we will discuss this uh, once more in a moment. What? Y m is of order one, y, whereas y u is of order 10 to the minus five, and this is about just what's needed to get uh, one of the neutrino masses to be less than one electron volt. Okay, so as I said, this is taken from, uh, classical literature, uh, Ulysses, one of his adventures, he had to, there was some, uh, he was uh, with his boat, he was squeezed between a uh, rock on the one hand and uh, a violent torrent on the other. So he had to decide whether to get, uh, crash his boat on the rock or get uh, swallowed by, by this uh, torrent. So the rock is the lander pole and the torrent is the De destabilization of the potential um, uh, through fermionic contributions. So let me remind you what the Landau pole is. Everybody knows that, but nevertheless, if you look at the beta function equation with the posit positive coefficient, solve it, then as is well known, the couplings blow up at uh, one, in this one loop uh, uh, solution. They blow up at a value of about this, this region, which means that the, uh, the model is become strongly coupled for those uh, energies. Um, and this is, this is uh, as far as I understand, is one of the worries about the standard model Higgs is that, you know, it has this kind of equation and uh, it looks like the, it will be strongly coupled at, uh, you, know, you know, some larger value. And then we don't know how to make sense of this uh, theory. 
It could either mean it's strongly coupled and we don't know what that really means, or it could simply mean that the model just doesn't exist. In pure fight to the force, from the, when you uh, discuss it from the point of view of constructive quantum field theory, it's believed that this uh, theory doesn't exist. I mean, as a non-trivial theory satisfying all the Whiteman axioms. Um, and uh, this Landau pole, if you like, is a first indication of that uh, fact. The, uh, the other danger is that the, the fermionic contributions to the effective uh, uh, potential are negative. So if you just take those, uh, the potential turns around the wrong way, becomes unbounded from below. You will not find a minimum, but rather maximum and uh, uh, tachyonic uh, uh, masses. So that's, that's, the, that's the other danger. Now I should like to emphasize that um, um, the standard model does have large sectors which are asymptotically not free. So with a standard uh, matter, <coughs> these Landau poles are unavoidable, which means that from the point of view of a rigorous field theorist, the standard model is probably doomed as a quantum field theory. It just doesn't exist. However, the point of view now is that uh, uh, there's some other theory at the Planck scale. And therefore, e even though these, these uh, difficulties are unavoidable in some sense, they become irrelevant if we succeed in shifting them beyond the Planck scale, where we expect uh, new physics anyway. By the way, in the, this, this is also what the uh, MSSM does, although in a different way in a different way, in the, in the uh, minimal super, I mean, from this point of view, quadratic divergences are not so, so, I mean, that's not the essential point here, but it's rather the renormalization group equations and the way the uh, uh, renormalization, the couplings evolve and the MSSM achieves that by imposing a symmetry which puts the scalar self couplings equal to the gauge couplings to the fourth power, a little bit like in original Como. Weinberg, and by tying these coupling constants together, you achieve that uh, you can postpone this difficulty uh, beyond the Planck scale. So we'll try to do something similar with the, um, but with this previous model. So here's the renormalization group equations, which are not, well, kind of. I, just the technical point I would like to mention is that it appears that the relevant uh, quantity is not lambda, but lambda divided by 4 pi squared, because this is, this is when you make this redefinition, all the pi squares drop out in these one loop equations. Now and then, uh, this, is, this is what you get. I have, hope you can see this. Um, and this is, this is where the sort of we have played with the parameters to make this work. Um, so what you see here is the following. So here the very the scalar coupling constants, the two u covers, and this is the strong. This is just asymptotic freedom. And now you see what happens. Um, so here's the strong coupling, the top quark coupling. This would, being asymptotically non-free, this would blow up. So that's the danger of a Landau pole here. But it is here that strong interactions help, because there's a contribution from alpha strong in the, these evolution equations, which sort of pulls this down, negative contribution, and makes, I mean, eventually this will blow up again, but it sort of delays the onset of this uh, pole for much longer. This is the scalar coupling, which, uh, which starts out, we have to take lar relatively large because the, the Higgs mass is so large. So this, this would also blow up if it were not for the Yukawa contribution from the Yukawa <coughs> coupling constant, which sort of pulls it down. So in some sense you see, or it looks a little bit like, you know, strange as they are, the coupling constants in the standard model, also varying over a large uh, range, it looks a little bit like, you know, they sort of conspire, or could possibly conspire to make this work. The second scalar actually is also helpful in the sense that, you know, we don't need to take this so large because there's another scalar that pulls the equation up. But for example, this one has to be kept reasonably small. This is the one mixing the two scalars. Yeah? I'm sorry. Which one is the coupling in front of the five? Is that the 
Oh, this, this, is, this is the lambda phi to the fourth of the uh, standard Higgs. This is the lambda mixing the phi old phi squared with the new phi squared. And this is the lambda, this is the phi, square, phi to the fourth for the new scalar field. And you see this, this has nothing, well this has the, and this is the new u kava involving the right-handed neutrinos. So this one helps this one a little bit, but th for this one there's no fermionic contribution that can make it. Can I ask you, in the upper right-hand corner, why is there no evolution of the No, no, there is, but it's, it's, uh, there is eventually, but uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's so small that it just doesn't, Oh, oh, by the way, oh, they should also say that this one is also supported a little bit because the phi force for the new scalar field is helped by this, uh, by the uh, new Yukawa coupling constant involving the right-handed neutrinos coupled to that scalar field, so they help a little bit with it. So it's so basically, <coughs> yes, right. The against that lambda yes. The right yes. Such yes. A way that the is right. That's Right, that's that's the that's the idea. So, so let me now come to the dis discuss this because there are, of course, uh, several questions you can raise about this. Well, first of all, let me emphasize once more we've sort of you know tuned it in such a way that couplings do stay bounded up to very you know very large. You can take this as a representative uh, number. There's no instabilities, also up to rather large values. So it looks like, you know, by fine-tuning things in this way and exploiting the values as they are, plus uh, injecting some new values for the new fields, this model may remain viable much beyond uh, one TeV. Okay, let me now come to the caveats. I should. For, for, uh, for what we have taken as input, the experimental well, the no oh, sorry. We, we yeah, for the Yukawa certainly, and for the scalar fields, we took as starting points. So this is a little bit a posteriori because with with this dimensional, with this effective potential, it's sort of difficult to normalize things from a priori. So what we do, we go to the minimum, calculate the fourth derivatives, and take those as the starting values for the normalization group equation. Okay, so then now for the caveats, I should like to thank Marty Einhorn. He has kept emphasizing this to us, and I certainly appreciate um, your worries. I've worried for, about this for a long time. So the question is, how credible is this? Well, that's first of all the, the numerics, but there's also a question of higher order corrections. But it's not only that. It's not only taking coupling constants small, because you might think, well, if I want to connect it to by perturbation theory to, uh, you know, to free theory, then maybe let's just choose small coupling constants. But it may turn out, there's also a problem with large field values, say. It may turn out that you choose the coupling small, but this minimum turns out to be so far away that actually you're outside the range of uh, uh, perturbation theory. However, there's one thing that uh, is always true if this is to work. The fact that the one loop contribution must be of the same order of the, as the tree level contribution. This is simply because otherwise you will not be able to move the minimum away from zero. You must have something that competes with the tree level term. So what are the necessary requirements? I'm sort of trying to phrase this in my own words uh, for this thing to work. Well, first of all, stability, meaning it's not unbounded below. Of course, you want it to be such that there's a minimum and not a maximum. And then you must somehow ensure that uh, the higher orders are smaller <coughs> than these two orders. Such is believed to be the case for original coleman weinberg scalar electrodynamics. Now, here it's, of course, much more difficult. And the thing that, uh, you know, that enters here is uh, this log multiplied by a coupling constant. There's something called the leading log. I, I'm still learning this. Maybe I should say this. Uh, the leading log approximation <coughs> contains powers of uh, this. There will be higher order powers of this and higher order perturbation theory. Subleading terms have this multiplied by powers of uh, coupling constants. 
So in some sense, what you must do is you must somehow try to keep this small. Well, either by playing around with this normalization scale, which in our scheme, you know, it's a sort of arbitrary number. In the beginning, I told you how to do the replacement for the dimensionally regulated integrals. There's a sort of arbitrary factor which I can inject here. Now for the values, it comes back to this caveat which, which we have. This thing is about on the order of 20, and when you multiply it by the corresponding value of the coupling constant, it's such that indeed this whole thing is of order 1. However, we think that uh, in fact the coupling constant which appears in front of this is not just the, self, the scalar self-coupling, but there's a competition cancellation, potential cancellation between this and the Yukawa coupling and other the coupling constant in the theory. Actually, we think we have a, at least a toy model, simpler than this, where we can have a, an exact solution of the uh, renormalization group equation for the leading log, where you actually can see this effect, first of all, that this is of the same order of magnitude, and this is true as long as this is satisfied. So the key question, and I admit openly that, yes, Yeah, we could do that, yes. And you need to get some equation like lambda order e4. And you haven't got that. You're outside the range of perturbation theory where your lambda log terms are <coughs> with the three terms. It just doesn't work. Now, there is a solution to this model, I believe. Yes. Well, we could, I mean, another way to argue is that, you know, I mean, I've learned this from your papers, that you can sort of try to optimize the choice of this V in yeah. such a way that... Uh, it's invariably, you can choose it the order of the minimum. Yes. The logs are all over one, and you can look to the minimum. You, you can find it in your model, I think, because I looked a little. Yeah, I can right. tell you where it is. Now, it just doesn't work yeah. here. The same problem like in lambda phi to the there's another, this way, is like there's another way of saying it won't work, which is even yes. simpler. Okay. Uh, which is to use the renormalization group to write down the exact effect of the thing, say for lambda phi 4 in terms of yes. the running coupling. Mm -hmm. And then you can see it automatically. Well, for, for lambda phi to the fourth, I would uh, agree, yes. Yeah. But you could use that generally to scale all the things. Yeah, but so we. the same conclusion. So you get the lambda phi. Yeah, but we've arranged things in such a way that the lambda pole. Uh, I was aware that uh, I would uh, get some <laughs> objections. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, okay, I, I let me let me put it this way. There's there's, you know, you may believe this or you may not believe this. But uh, at least for this model, we have a prediction which, uh, which is rather clean. And therefore, there's a clean way to, I mean, experimental way to uh, falsify this model. And just let me say this, um, which, oh, sorry, which has, uh, uh, which involves this, uh, this uh, Higgs mixing. Namely, uh, as I told you, that the mass eigenstate in this model is not the same as the weak interaction uh, eigenstate, um, which means that uh, you have a di diagram like that. So this, this, Higgs this Higgs field may oscillate into this uh, uh, companion uh, scalar field. So assuming that this, this uh, thing is sufficiently heavy, so you get, for example, this kind of decay, and I'm told that this is a clean way to discover it, uh, one will have the following effect. Uh, this, this may oscillate into the new scalar field, and the new scalar field couples only to the right-handed neutrinos. So with the values that we have, 
it does not, uh, it cannot decay. So we'll just uh, oscillate back into the original Higgs. So what this would show is that there's the, there's the Higgs resonance, but there will be another resonance uh, because <coughs> the decay modes are decay channels that are kinematically accessible to both of them will be such that the branching ratios are the same. So what you will see is a second resonance which uh, just looks like the uh, uh, a shadow of this uh, original Higgs. Okay, well, uh, there are some points maybe we should uh, discuss later. But let me emphasize once more that conformal invariance is a very nice symmetry. And in some sense, it may still be the best explanation why we live in, uh, in four space-time dimensions. Apart from two dimensions, uh, uh, conformal field theory is not very interesting outside uh, uh, four dimensions. So uh, you have a rich variety of models to choose from. Um, well, if you believe this, either you don't believe it or if you, <laughs> if you believe this, then or it have it, at least a tendency not to dismiss it right away, then uh, the, the question is whether, uh, how could something like this ever emerge out of a theory, namely quantum gravity, which is known not to be uh, conformally invariant. Well, actually, we, we have also done other, computed other things like effective potentials, temperature dependent, um, uh, temperature dependent effective potentials. But uh, we decided that before pressing on with this, perhaps we should work a little harder to, to try to convince some of our disbelieving colleagues that this may yet have a chance to work. Well, I'm almost. Uh, finished, but I would like to end with a few personal words to both of you. Um, it's, it's now 23 years ago that I first came to Israel, and I should say at the time, I did so with uh, some trepidation in view of my country's history, and uh, it then turned out to be, it was together with my wife, a very impressive visit, not only because of all the cultural and archaeological treasures one could see here, but also because uh, I realized that uh, abstract knowledge of historical facts is one thing, but uh, meeting, actually meeting people and realizing that about everyone I met, or we met, was in one way or another affected by this history. So I should say that I'm all the more grateful for, for this wonderful friendship. <laughs> Water century of friendship. And I should acknowledge the help of Udi Fuchs, <laughs> <laughs> who has also uh, um, helped me practice with the pronunciation. Tada avur shanim rabot shel haferut. Triviality contour up here. <coughs> and then, okay, you folks have all seen this diagram before. Sorry? This is the mass of the top part. And this is just the ordinary standard model. 
So along this contour, you run into the Landau pole or triviality. On this contour, you run into the, in, across this contour, you run into the instability where the Higgs potential dips down and goes to minus infinity. So then if you take the real value of the top quark mass at about 170 or 172, um, you come to some point here, which is at a Higgs mass of 130 GeV. And then Rattazzi, I believe, has shown that you can go out in this direction until you hit the limit of metastability. And, oh, please excuse me, down this way, in, until you hit the limit of metastability, and that occurs at about 112, which is roughly comparable to the current value of the Higgs mass from below coming from left. So there's this region, which, as far as I know, is a perfectly consistent place where the ordinary standard model will live. And there are no objections. There, the potential exists. In this case, all the way to the Planck scale and beyond. In this case, far enough out that the ordinary Higgs solution is perfectly metastable. No one, as far as I know, considers this a solution to the hierarchy problem. But nevertheless, it's a perfectly consistent realization of the standard model. This is model. the conformal, uh, classically conformal invariant theory. Well, what, I, what I'm, I'm saying is that Nikolai is basically doing the same thing in another diagram which is the mass of the phi and the mass of the heavy neutrino. So there's a similar curve that you can draw. And where he wants to work is at a point on that curve. And then through the mixing of this with the Oops. Phi, oh, no, no. through the mixing of the phi with the ordinary things, you then get a C2 cross U1 break. I think it will work. <laughs> It's true. The consistent solution is that lambda one is on the order of the top is set by the top map, top coupling. Lamb the other lambda is set by the neutrino coupling, and lambda two is a mixing term. You can adjust the so there's a solution. At the end of the day though, the X is light. Well because Oh, the, this one. Yes. That's dangerous because through this mixing, and, and you can see that, I think, pretty clearly from the second diagram, through this mixing, you're also going to get corrections to precision electroweak from this helix. And those will be basically proportional to the sine squared of the mixing angle Which is times small. the logarithm of the mass. So if the sine squared of the mixing angle is greater than about 0.2, you're uh, in violation of precision electroweak. Yes, uh, zero one. 0 0.1. 0 0.1. Okay, so then you might be okay. But that's something else to watch out for. Other than that, I think.